Hello everybody, I wanted to talk to you all about one of the biggest challenges I deal with as a coach and a teacher with my clients and that is weight fluctuations and really helping people understand what's going on. This is a huge challenge for me because it's when the scale fluctuates that's when people get disheartened and they're not thinking rationally and this is where they give up and throw in the towel. So weight fluctuations can be impacted by many, many things. The scale is a valuable tool, but too many people get emotionally attached to it. And when that happens, they become almost unreasonable and irrational. They beat themselves up over a number that may or may not be accurate. Instead of taking a step back and taking a deep breath and looking realistically at why the scale would be fluctuating. Why does the scale spike up sometimes? Why does it stay at the same number for a while? And why does it not just keep going down when you have been on point with your nutrition and exercise and everything? I know a lot of people have a negative relationship with the scales. The scale can definitely mess with our minds, but it is a tool. It's a valuable tool. It can be used at different stages throughout your journey. It's relevant for different circumstances and ages, and it is a tool, but it will change from time to time. And there's many, many reasons why it's going to do that. Uh, I've listed several on my Instagram and my Facebook business page recently. I believe that was Saturday just gone, but let's take a look. What could be causing the scale to fluctuate? So one of the first things is going to be sleep. Sleep is always number one. One of the reasons that sleep is going to impact the scale, especially if you've had a week of poor sleep. Um, Generally, most women will look at women are very sensitive to changes in sleep patterns, especially inflammation. Sleep is where we do our detoxification. Sleep is where we regenerate and regrow and basically reset. We push down inflammation when we sleep. We reset glycogen stores in the brain when we sleep. We really reset the body. Sleep is where we float our weight as well. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, But when we don't have good sleep, for example, you could weigh on a Friday morning and be 140 pounds. And then weigh again on Saturday morning and be 142 pounds. But you're like, hold on, I did everything perfect yesterday. But I had a poor night's sleep because the dog was vomiting or my husband was snoring or something like that. That is a reflection of how poor sleep impacts the scales. Poor sleep will drive up inflammation and fluid retention, which we're going to get into next Poor sleep will feel like you're swelling and your bo- your brain is just trying to push out through your skull. You might feel flushed. You might have aches and pains. Um, and this is all kind of that uh, immune response because your body's like, hold on, what happened? I didn't get my normal sleep cycle or I didn't get the amount of sleep that I need to recover from the day or the week or the demands that I've had on me. So sleep is number one. Poor sleep, I see it all the time, whether or not it's the night before people check in with me or they've had a whole week of poor sleep, that generally is going to impact the scale. But that's not necessarily fat. That is a lot going to be inflammation and other factors, which we're going to get into Sleep of poor sleep, of course, will drive up cravings and false hunger and impact your willpower. So there is the chance that you're going to maybe eat more carbs or food that you shouldn't, and that might cause body fat gain. But if you weren't doing all of that and everything else was on track and all you had was poor sleep all week, then that's not body fat that you've gained. That is a reflection of the poor sleep. So the next one then is going to be inflammation. Inflammation affects nearly all of us, some of us more than other. Inflammation is a protective mechanism. It's a response to tissue damage or stress or to toxic 
exposure, chemicals, molecules in the environment or that you touched or ingested. And if you have a genetic over-exuberant response, you could create a lot of inflammation. Some people very sensitive to inflammation, some people not so much, some people a bit more resilient. So inflammation causes the body to retain water, basically in the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid in between the cells. And this helps then to dilate the toxic inflammatory com chemicals or molecules from damaging your cells and tissues and basically to buy your liver and kidneys time to filter out whatever the problem might be. Inflammation can be caused by poor sleep because it's a stress. Inflammation can be caused by banging your knee off the table. That's going to be more isolated inflammation, but it's still inflammation. Inflammation can be caused by emotional stress. We will get into that as well. Inflammation can be caused by exposure to too many toxins or pollutants in the air. Um, one example would be I'll go into um, bath and body and I always come out feeling nauseous and with a headache. I've had too much exposure to those chemicals. My body's going to launch an immune response there. The headache is that inflammatory response and the nausea is my body's trying to convulse or get those molecules out of me. So that's just an example. Inflammation be can be caused by many things. Most of my clients are very in tune with their body. Uh, they recognize different biomarkers. They'll know like, oh, I feel inflamed this morning. I feel feel aches and pains, I feel flushed, swelling, um, and, and they'll generally know what's caused that. So inflammation is a big one to weight fluctuations on the scales. Then another consideration is illness. A lot of people don't know that illness, even if you like are so sick, you can't eat anything at all, and you're just laying on the couch watching Netflix for two or three days, Illness can still cause an inflammatory response because, again, that immune mechanisms. Illness very much causes you to retain fluid while your immune system is fighting the good fight. Um, so when someone has some sort of virus or pathogen that they're fighting, it's very common that they'll swell up, they'll feel very inflamed, they'll have a lot of that fluid retention which then is going to impact the scales. And even if you were sick Monday to Wednesday, and then you weigh on Saturday, you may still have that lingering inflammation as your body's killing off the last bit of the pathogen. You might feel fine. Oh, I was sick during the week, but I'm fine now. Well, that still may be lingering in your body. Another one is constipation. Sometimes the scale is just going to go up because you haven't pooped properly in a while or a few days. This is really common, um, like really common, especially in the freezing cold weather, because I sound like a broken record saying this, but we have the heating on and the air conditioning. People generally don't drink a lot of fluids in the cold weather. They feel like they don't need it or they don't want it. And then you have like the air conditioning, you have the dry air outside in Alberta, you've got the air conditioning on your car, you've got the heating on. Dehydration is one of the main causes of constipation. If you haven't had a proper bowel movement all week, and then you step on the scale on Saturday, and it's either the same as it's been for maybe the last few weeks, or it's up a bit, chances are you're just backed up with food and waste and that's all going to have a weight. So a lot of the times with people, it can just be they haven't had a proper bowel movement and even before they go to stand on the scale, which a lot of people can't because there's that idea of pressure, I need to have a bowel movement. But um, that can definitely be one of the causes that the scale is going to fluctuate. Um, especially if you're good on your water one week, but the next week you're not, and you might also have other symptoms like a headache and irritability or a migraine or something. So most people will know this is more of a kind of recognition reminder kind of thing. Um, so the next one would be your menstrual cycle and menopause. Most women know that we can retain anywhere from three to six pounds of fluid from the first couple of days before our period starts right through till the last day when it ends. So it doesn't matter really how good you are. You could stand on the scale and not see it moving and you're on your cycle 
and the scale is still just stagnant or up a couple of pounds and there's nothing any of us can do about that that's just one of the blessings of being a woman and another blessing is then that that menopausal or perimenopausal woman or even estrogen dominant women fluid retention can be higher in these women due to higher levels of vasopressin which causes fluid retention so vasopressin acts on the v2 subtype or vasopet vasopressin receptors in the collecting duct cells of the kidneys to cause water retention and antidiuresis. This can also happen, we will get to stress in a minute, but this can also um, be one of the reasons why women might urinate more at night depending on their age or where they are on their life cycle, if they are perimenopausal, and then stress would come in there to impact that. So the next thing would be, I wanna look at sodium or salt. There are individual tolerance levels for sodium, um, but a high amount for you, because this is all relative to the individual. If you eat more salt on a given day than you normally do, your body will hold on to water. So you will weigh more on the scale. But because you weigh more, that doesn't mean you have gained fat. It just means you're weighing more. And it's the same if, if you held a liter bottle of water in your hands and you stood on the scale. You will be up on the scale. Most people would be able to rationalize that that extra weight is the bottle of water and not body fat. The same goes for this instance and vice versa. If you add less salt on a given day, the next morning you might weigh less. And in this case, that weight fluctuation down, it isn't necessarily true weight because the next day, if you go back to your normal salt intake, the weight might go back up again. So you can see how like finely tuned the body is and how it likes to keep us on our toes. Carbs is another one. If you eat more carbs than you normally do in a day, your body will hold on to more water. Carbs act like a sponge. Carbohydrates, the glycogen molecules, they bind to water. Carbohydrates suck up the water. So they cause you to retain fluid and at the same time they increase dehydration. So you drink more fluid. So if you eat less carbs, you will lose water. And this happens to people who do keto or low carb, they lose a lot of water in the beginning and then their weight will slow down because they have less water to lose over time. But if you eat more carbs than you're used to or than you do on an average day, like a refeed day or a carb reload day or something like that, you're gonna weigh more, but that doesn't mean that it's body fat. It just means you're holding on to the water and potentially the waste from the extra food if you haven't had a bowel movement or digest it and process it. Um, next is if you eat late in the day, then you'll have the weight of the meal and the waste in your body. So you're eating later in the day and then you get up the next morning to weigh at the same time you normally do. You're probably going to weigh more because you didn't have your normal amount of time to process and deal with that late meal. So not your normal maybe feeding window. You haven't had enough time to digest and eliminate and metabolize whatever you ate. Similarly, if you wait earlier than usual in the morning, uh, this is common with my clients when they're going on vacation or they have to be on the road early for a hockey game or work or something. If they weigh in at 5 a.m. instead of their regular 8 a.m. time, you basically have less time to float the weight off and you potentially have inflammation because you didn't have your normal night's sleep or your normal length of time or you broke the cycle, like there's a lot of things, but this is not fat gain, this is just weight gain. Floating weight, like I mentioned earlier, floating weight is generally the loss of water and weight throughout the night. So you might go to bed 142 pounds and then you wake up 140 pounds. That's because you'll have lost a lot of water during the night while you're exhaling and sweating and 
um, metabolizing everything, just staying alive, but also you may have broken down some fat, you've digested some food, you've put nutrients here or there, you've pulled down inflammation. So that's your float weight that usually happens across the night. That's what um, in the boxing world or UFC or martial arts, they'll can call or refer to as floating weight. It will change across the night. Um, so there's that. So eating later and weighing at your normal time, that can cause weight gain. Eating normal and weighing earlier, that can cause weight gain. Um, and then next is exercise. If you lift weights, exercise is an amazing activity or thing to do for your health. It's one of the few things that you can do and still get health benefits even if you don't change your nutrition. But if you lift weights, you're breaking down muscle and you're purposely creating an inflammatory response. So when your muscles get damaged, they have the ability to uptake a lot of glycogen or sugar and water and nutrients. They're, they'll act like a sponge. So when you step on the scale, you can weigh more, especially after like a heavy workout or a heavy leg day because those muscles are so big that they're going to suck up a lot of nutrients and water and glycogen. So it doesn't mean that you've gained fat, it just means you had a heavy leg day and this is your body's response. And that does lead us into stress because exercise is a stress. It's a good stress, but it's still a stress. Um, but other stresses like emotional stress has the potential to cause weight gain. There's the inflammatory response. Uh, when we are stressed, your body generally will hold on to a lot of water. And you see that when people relax or they go on vacation, um, they let go of a lot of water and it looks like you weigh less, which is not necessarily fat loss, but weight loss. And then when you are stressed, you gain the water back or you hold on to water and it looks like you gained weight. Um, one of the areas that we see this a lot in is adrenal fatigue or exhaustion or just fatigue. People have very busy lives nowadays, running, go, 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 exercise, fasting, just as everything's go. And then when they go away on vacation for a week or two and they come back and they're like, oh my God, I didn't gain anything. Um, well, maybe you did or didn't, but chances are you let go of six or more pounds of inflammation and fluid retention because you relaxed, you laughed, you had fun, you didn't have to think about work or groceries or dishes or school or any of that fun stuff. So relaxing really does play a part in weight gain and the whole fat loss process. Um, and with stress as well, I mentioned exercise is a stress, but also under eating, especially under eating if you're over exercising or shall we say over living each day, too much work, driving around, bringing kids to 10 different events, blah, 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 like and under eating. So not eating enough to fuel your lifestyle, that's going to be a stressor. So basically, if your weight jumps up randomly, or even for a few days, it doesn't mean it's fat gain. 95% of the time, if you're doing everything to plan, it's, it's going to be one of those things that I've just mentioned. So don't let emotions take over. Look at things logically. Look at the data and then keep going because you can't keep doing everything right and showing up for yourself daily and not eventually get results is when people don't look at these changes in numbers or fluctuations rationally and they attach too much emotion and why is this not moving I'm doing everything right and I want it to move and it should be and then they say this isn't working and then they throw in the towel they just give up and then go off track or whatever they do. A few months later, they start again. They're just caught in this vicious cycle. So in order to be successful for life and keep 
going with this healthy lifestyle and your results for life, you really have to look at things rationally and, okay, this is just a moment in time. I've been doing everything right. Let's look at this logically. Let's look at the data and look at the overall trend as well. A few weeks ago, I did a video on my YouTube channel called Measuring Body Fat, Measuring and Tracking Body Fat, and I really spoke about we're looking at the trend over time. If that trend is consistently going in the direction that we're going in, or we want to go in, that we're making progress then. So if you haven't checked out that video, it's pretty good, I might say, um, because I also discuss like, these are the best ways, and this is what we want to do. We want to be consistent, the same machine, the same tool, the same day of the week, the same time, keeping that consistency as much as possible, and then watching the trend over time. So I hope you found this helpful. I hope this really helps you on the next time that you check in with me or your coach or your personal trainer or whatever it is so that you can really reflect, you know, well, this has been a great week, but my sleep was terrible or um, my period's due in a few days or I've had a lot of stress recently or something like that. As always, please let me know if you have any questions or feedback and share with anyone you think might benefit from this information, which I think might be almost everyone. Okay, have a great day, guys. Bye.